Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to be discussing the binomial distribution. Okay, so we know how to deal with just discrete random variables in general. We know their properties, some of that kind of stuff. Um, but, but sometimes we may recognize specific situations where we can apply some, some special distributions, right? We've, we've seen before that we kind of have, have two situations, right? We have continuous random variables and we have discrete random variables, right? But we have special cases. Right? And what we're going to talk about today is, is the binomial here. It's a special case of discrete random variables. And there are lots of other special distributions too, but, but really the one we're going to focus on here is our binomial. Okay, so, so that's where this kind of fits in in the big picture. So how about the binomial specifically? All right, well, it handles cases where there's only two potential outcomes, um, special situations of, of what are called Bernoulli trials. Right? And this is essentially what a Bernoulli trial is, a situation where we have two specific outcomes. Right? So in order to apply our binomial distribution, here's what we have to check. We have a fixed number of Bernoulli trials. Right, so what it should tell us somewhere in the problem, okay, we're doing this, we're repeating this process in times, whatever that might be. Right, we also need each one to fall in just two categories. We, we've already mentioned that, but one category we need to be able to call success or one outcome a success, the other a failure. Or maybe one outcome is a success and we group the rest of the outcomes into failures. Right, the last two oftentimes come together, right? each of these trials need to be independent, and we have to have a constant probability of success P that we can identify there for each trial. Okay, if we can say yes to all four of these conditions, then we can say a random variable is a binomial random variable, and it's noted with two, two parameters N and P. Remember N is your total number of trials, P is the probability of success on any one of those given independent trials. Right? X, a binomial random variable, counts the number of successes that we see in our n trials. So if you're doing something n times, you could potentially get zero successes, okay? or you could get up to n successes. Okay? So a binomial random, random variable is bounded by zero and n. All right, so let's think about an example to kind of go alongside building the ideas of the binomial. Now we're gonna we're gonna start with a pretty simple example, like flipping a coin and, and flipping it five times. And these these probabilities and these ideas, we could do this with just our basic probability rules that we already know about, right? So like this case, we only have five trials. So we have a fixed number of trials. Let's check if it fits our binomial. Yes, fixed number of trials. Should each of these be independent? Yes, one coin toss shouldn't affect the other. Are there only two outcomes, heads or tails? Yes. Does our probability of success remain constant? Yes, we'll call a success. Let's just call a success getting heads. All right, so once we know it fits the binomial, how do we find some probabilities? All right, we'll say we want to know what's the probability of getting two heads in five tosses. So we can define this as binomial n equal to 5, p equal to 0.5, with our probability equal to 2. All right, so let's think back to our basic probability rules and kind of visualize this sample space. All right, well, we know there's only two possibilities. I'm doing it n times. So there's 32 total outcomes here. Now, if we were to write all these out and picture them, there we go. Right? What we'll see is it's possible to do in this case because there's only 32 outcomes. We, we could write them all out and list them all if we want here. Right? But imagine if you flipped a coin 10 times. Imagine what that sample space would look like. Right? 2 to the 10th, what is that, 1,024 or something like that. Okay? So 
we're, we're demonstrating this with a small n so that we can kind of have the sample space along with us. But the, the point of the binomial is we can extend this to a bunch of things and we'll find some, we'll find some shortcuts, we'll find some, some formulas, some simple easy formulas that we can plug into to be able to use. Okay, so we're going to start building this binomial formula. So the first part of the binomial formula, often called the, the binomial coefficient, is it tells us well, how many ways can I get k or x successes in n trials. All right? If you're familiar with this mathematical idea of combinations, right, we actually have a, a formula that's built to do that. Right, so I can use what's called here this choose function. It's not, and, and oftentimes this is, when, when people see this, they think it's n divided by k, but it's not, right? It's n factorial, right? This is our factorial operator over k factorial times n minus k factorial, right? So remember, k could be anything from 0 to n. And if you're not familiar with how the factorial function works, there you go. It's, it's pretty easy. And there's a button for that on most calculators. Right, so this is read as n choose k. Speaking of calculators, um, it's sometimes it's it's a button on your calculator, other notation. Sometimes it's like this, n c k, or even n c r. On a lot of calculators, it's n c r. Okay, so that's the first part of our function. So what what exactly does that tell us? So remember, we were looking for how many different ways can I get two heads in five coin tosses. Well, using that function and plugging in, if I work that out, it tells me there's 10 ways that can happen. Okay, so let's see if this, let's see if this function is correct. Right, so it tells me there's 10 ways of getting two heads in five flips. We're calling heads a success. Let's revisit our sample space. If we were to go in and count these up, we find that there are 10 of those. Okay, so now we know there's 10 possibilities out of the 32, right? And these are all equally likely. So actually you might be thinking, well, we could just say 10 out of 32, and that's true. But remember, this is a special case here because heads and tails are equally likely. What if success and failure is not equally likely? Okay, so what do we know so far? Right? We know there's 10 ways that what we're looking for can happen. We know the probability of heads is 0.5, the probability of success Right? And we also know they're independent. Getting heads has no effect on the second. So think about two of those sequences. Right? Heads, heads, tails, tails, tails. Heads, tails, tails, heads, tails. Take those two for example. Think about their probabilities and what we know about independence. Should these probabilities be the same? Yes. So if we know there's 10 of them, we really only have to find the probability of one of those sequences Right, so that is the next part of our function. And we can use the multiplication rule for independent events. Right, so if I were to try to find the probability of, say, this sequence, right, I could write it out like that, and I can group my successes and failures. Right, so notice here, Probability of success and failure happen to be the same just for ease of demonstration, but that's definitely not always the case. It turns out to be this. Now notice here how we grouped our successes raised to the number of successes, our probability of failure raised to the number of failures that we're interested in. That's the idea of the second piece of our function. Okay. Also remember that sometimes, if I know my probability of failure, or I know my probability of success, my probability of failure is going to be 1 minus P, or my probability of success. This is often also called Q. All right, so take my probability of success, raise it to my number of successes, probability of failure, raise to my number of failures. Okay, so let's put all that together. Combine both of those pieces to get this. All right, so there are three inputs into this formula. N, K, or often this is, you may see an X there. 
and P. You also, another variation of this formula, you may see a Q there. All right, so let's try to apply that to our example. Remember, a probability of two heads, and five coin tosses, 10 ways that can happen. We found one of those is 0.3, so our probability should be this. Let's check that with our formula with our given inputs. Plug them all in there, do the math, and we get matching answers. All right, so that's the idea of the probability function. Right? There's a lot going on in that formula, but once we break it down, once we know where it comes from, it's pretty easy to work with. Okay, and remember, we know what the first part does, we know what the second part does. The point here is, it calculates the probability of X being equal to one specific amount of success. Right? So what if I need to find less than some number, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, some cumulative probability? Well, one way you can do it is if possible, use that function multiple times. Okay. But in most cases, we probably recommend using some sort of technology. All right, the last thing we need to talk about with the binomial is its mean and variance. Again, we know how to find the mean and variance and standard deviation of a general random variable. And it's doable, but it, it does take some work. All right, what about the binomial? What if I told you, okay, I'm going to do something 10 times, like maybe um, I'm going to go shoot 10 free throws, right? And say I'm a 70% free throw shooter, and I ask you, okay, how many do you expect me to make? Well, you would say seven, right? So what did you do? In your mind, you said 10 times 0.7 gives me seven. That's how we find the mean of a binomial, super simple formula. Right, we find the variance by taking NPQ, then we know our standard deviation is the square root of our variance. Alright, so thinking back, we need to be able to first identify a binomial situation, and then we can apply all of these formulas to make our lives a little simple. Right, the binomial may not seem simple at first, Right? But it is a shortcut because no matter how big our numbers get, right, if our numbers get too big to do something with just our basic probability rules, we can apply these binomial rules if we recognize the situation. All right? So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.